Hello, welcome to this week's Reflections on the readings for the 6th Sunday of Easter, May the 14th, 2023. It also happens to be Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day to all of those who uh, are a mother to anyone in any way in their life. So congratulations on your day. Let me begin with the introduction for Sunday. Jesus does not abandon his followers. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus comes to abide with his disciples of every generation. As Pentecost draws near, we are reminded that the risen Christ dwells in us as the spirit of truth. We receive this spirit in baptism and pray that in our gathering around the Lord's table, the spirit will transform us to be the body of the risen Christ in the world. Let us use the prayer of the day for Sunday. Almighty and ever-living God, you hold together all things in heaven and on earth. In your great mercy, receive the prayers of all your children and give to all the world the spirit of your truth and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for Sunday comes from the Acts of the Apostles in the 17th chapter, verses 22 through 31. In Athens, Paul faces the challenge of proclaiming the gospel to Greeks who know nothing of either Jewish or Christian tradition. He proclaims that the unknown God whom they worship is the true Lord of heaven and earth who will judge the world with justice through Jesus, whom God has raised from the dead. Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and he said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Here ends the reading. Athens, Greece was an epicenter of intellectualism and philosophy. Classic education from 508 to 322 BC focused primarily on physical attributes and mainly for male Greek children primarily designed toward the ideals of the military, such as strength, stamina, and preparation for war. There was a lesser focus on the arts, music, dance, lyrics, and poetry. Higher education, as it was called, became more prominent around 420 BC with teachers we might recognize the names of, like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. This 
shift causes some friction among the Athenian classical educators, although in time it did attract people from other parts of the world and diverse cultures. More focused fields to, of study were such as mathematics, astronomy, harmonics, and dialect, all with an emphasis on the development of philosophical insight. It was seen as a necessary for individuals to use knowledge within the framework of logic and reason for the development of the whole person. Along with this diverse population and cultures came belief in diverse gods and deities. Those gathered in the Areopagus would have been part of the higher education schools. If today's reading would have begun at verse 21, we would have learned that all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. So let remind remind us all, Paul was a highly educated man by Roman standards and also he was a Pharisee. Paul was quite capable of standing toe to toe with these men of higher education. Paul chooses this specific place to present the intellectual and philosophical legitimacy of this movement of Jesus followers. In verse 23, Paul notes that he has seen an altar to an unknown God. And Paul uses this to pique their interest by suggesting he can teach them something to which they are ignorant. That's like hook and sinker there. It's important to note, Paul does not accuse them of stupidity. Paul is subtle in the way that he pays attention to what they believe and he honors their intelligence. So if we wish to emulate Paul, it is admirable that Paul is paying attention to what mattered to the Athenians. He observes their practices, and in his message, he even quotes their poetry. Paul's message about this unknown God does not deny the Athenians wisdom, nor does it call for a destruction of their ways of knowing. He does not address them in any kind of adversarial tones, rather in a way that invites them to open their minds to some new ideas. The psalm for Sunday is Psalm 66, verses 8 through 20. Bless our God, you peoples. Let the sound of praise be heard. Our God has kept among us the living and has not allowed our feet to slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us just as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid heavy burdens upon our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out into a place of refreshment. I will enter your house with burnt offerings and will pay you my vows. Those that I promised with my lips and spoke with my mouth when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt offerings of fatlings with the smoke of rams. I will give you oxen and goats. Come and listen all you who believe, and I will tell you what God has done for me. I called out to God with my mouth and praised the Lord with my tongue. If I had cherished evil in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. But in truth, God has heard me and has attended to the sound of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not rejected my prayer, nor withheld unfailing love from me. Here ends the psalm. Verse 8 proclaims, Bless our God, you peoples. And that line is being spoken to Gentiles, and maybe we better would understand it if we had begun with verse 1, which says, Shout for joy to God all the earth. So this psalm's message, the entire psalm, is for all other people to pay attention to the great God of the Jews, Yahweh. 
Today's section of the Psalm 66 may sound odd in our ears. The psalmist gives a very complicated portrayal of God's relationship to the Jewish community. God is the source of salvation, surely, yet the community also attributes its hardships to God's actions, God's inactions, and the people's actions. Granted, their thinking frustrates all our attempts to explain a definitive way of knowing how and why people suffer and why suffering happens. But the why question haunts us more than it did the Jewish people at that time. The Jewish people of that time did not have any theological tensions with the idea of a punitive God, especially when the disciplinary actions or inactions were deserved. Verse 10 reads, You, O God, have tested us. You have tried us just as silver is tried. Silver is purified by extreme heat. Then the impurities float to the surface and they can be skimmed off. This is used as a metaphor for the troubles the Jewish people have gone through because they will come out of the experience better off. In other words, purified. The psalm teaches us that the reality of God's power means that human life is oriented toward obedience and worship. The psalmist brings to God that which is costly and precious as sacrifices and offerings. Now this sort of language is difficult for modern Christians to understand. Yet at its heart, this sacrificial system shows that God's activities makes the psalmist think a little bit differently about what exactly matters, that which they hold to be valuable. We look at their sacrificial practices as primitive, and, and I agree with that. While at the same time, I find a particular kind of humor in the fact that we break out the grills to celebrate the weekend by burning meats of various kinds. Items of great value, like livestock in the ancient cultures, take on a new value when they are dedicated solely as a sacrifice in God's service. Imagine how much more we would complain about the price of meat if we grilled it without eating any of it ourselves. The psalmist's life itself takes on new value. Like the sacrifices that attest to God's power in the world, the psalmist's words and actions provide a testimony Evidence for God's power emerges from the words of the psalmist. The cries of praise and the cries of petition all bear witness to God's power. Even in the middle of testing and suffering, the cry of the psalmist is, Bless our God, you peoples. Let the sound of praise be heard. Our second reading for Sunday comes from the first letter of Peter in the third chapter, verses 13 through 22. The author of 1 Peter encourages Christians to remain faithful, even in the face of defamation and persecution. In baptism, we are made clean to act in accordance to what is right. Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ, may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. 
he was put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. At baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Here ends the reading. Verse 15 reads, Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. And I wonder whether our 21st century Western culture hears the word defense in the same word that Peter meant it. Some translators have used the word apology, which sounds even worse perhaps in our ears. In both of these usages, Paul, or excuse me, Peter is encouraging us to pre be prepared to explain why we have hope in Christ, or perhaps to explain why we place our faith in Christ. We do not apologize as in saying, oh, I'm sorry that we have faith in Christ. And Christ does not need us to get defensive on his behalf. As an aside, Christ also does not need us to get offensive on his behalf. If we have faith in Christ, then we are encouraged to be ready to tell others why. Verse 16 also tells us, do it with gentleness and reverence. Some have even suggested that we boil it down to an elevator speech. That is, to be able to share the reason we have faith in Christ in the small amount of time that it takes to ride up or down in an elevator. Well, that may work well in our present day and culture, yet that's not really what Peter is suggesting. The circumstances in Peter's letter are much more urgent than ours. If you've been following these reflections over the past few weeks, you likely heard Peter is writing to people in forced exile, probably suffering from persecution, as well as other of life's hardships for people who are not living in their own homes, not living among their own people, and probably not very well liked. That is why this section of 1 Peter speaks so much about suffering, especially suffering for doing good or because of their faith in Christ. And the implication to do it with gentleness and reverence is that the believers are not to return evil for evil, so to speak. Notice that Peter does not promise that the persecutors will get what's coming to them in the end times judgment. Peter's reasons for encouraging gentleness and reverence are so those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. We all have an ego. Sometimes our ego serves us well. And sometimes our ego wants to cry out in response to Peter, well, how is that supposed to help me? In situations where my ego cries out for vengeance, I try to remind my ego, it's not about you. Rather, it is about exposing the flawed, fake power of human persecution, unrighteousness, and sin. It's the same reason that Jesus stood silent before his accusers. Jesus' purpose was not to save his own individual mortal body. Jesus' purpose was to save the world, especially from sin and death. As Peter reminds us in verse 18, Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now, 
Please do not hear me saying that individually we can save the world through suffering. Rather, the way we face righteous suffering, that which God has ordained, will expose the lie that sin and death have any power over us. Our Gospel for Sunday comes according to St. John in the 14th chapter, verses 15 through 21. Glory to you, O Lord. In final words to his disciples on the night of his arrest, Jesus encourages obedience to his commandments and speaks of the Spirit who will be with them forever. Jesus said to the disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Many have heard Paul's 1 Corinthians 13, referred to as the Great Love Chapter. John's Gospel has often been referred to as a love letter to God's people. Theologians agree that John's Gospel does not focus on historical data. Rather, it's more mysterious, as in the great mysteries of God, or spiritual in nature. This reading follows immediately after last week's Gospel from John, and in this section, Jesus begins and ends speaking about love. Building on last week's Gospel reading, the focus is on the fear we feel when we lose a loved one who played an important role in our lives. As you will recall, Jesus is speaking to his closest followers who have stayed with him through a turbulent week, at least up until his arrest. Those of us who have the experience of losing a loved one, someone we really depended on, we know that we can become shaken and concerned about the future. Some of you watching this have suffered the loss of a spouse. I have not had that experience. I'm grateful that I have not. Although all four of my grandparents, both of my parents, Nearly all of my aunts and uncles have made the transition into the heavenly homes already. I vividly remember the moment I realized I have become one of the elders of the family. The people I depended on most were gone. It's a very lonely feeling. Building on last week's words, Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus now tells his disciples, I will not leave you orphaned. These words are significant. The Gospel of John is a reminder that we are not alone. In verse 16, Jesus tells his followers, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The advocate is what we call God's Holy Spirit or sometimes, as in this reading, the spirit of truth, which will continue to guide, comfort, and teach us. The Greek word in verse 16 is parakleton, or uh, the root word really being paraclete, and that can best be understood as someone who walks along beside. In last Sunday's sermon, I told a story about a frightened little boy 
who didn't want to be by himself in the night. He wanted someone with skin on. We cannot have Jesus alongside us with skin on. Yet, we also have not been left orphaned either. We have the mysterious presence of God's Holy Spirit that will never leave us or forsake us. I can no longer turn to my parents for help or their wisdom, their advice, yet I can turn to God through God's Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit also sent us to walk along beside the church community, the body of Christ. And God's Spirit walks along beside us as we all join together as the body of Christ. When God's Holy Spirit is given primacy in our decision making as individuals or as the community, the church, it tears down barriers that our human side, our ego side, chooses to erect. And it replaces suspicion. It replaces prejudice with a simple word, love. Now, it's not simple to do, but it is a simple word. Let me read again for the first and last verses of this reading. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then again at the end, they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them. For God, for Jesus, love is not just merely some nice sentiment like we celebrate on Valentine's Day. Love is for every day, and love produces a response toward God and toward others. Read again Paul's 1 Corinthians 13, or recall Jesus' greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with everything in you, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. The big challenge, though, I think, as hard as those are to follow, technically, literally, always, the big challenge Jesus gives us in Matthew 5 44 as part of the Sermon on the Mount Jesus says love your enemies while our human nature our ego says hate our enemies Jesus says no love your enemies pray for those who persecute you God's Holy Spirit is with us to help us become spiritually mature. My definition for spiritually mature is that we become just like Jesus. The Apostle Paul teaches us that we continue to strive toward that all our life, I think he meant. I've not yet reached that level of spiritual maturity. Sometimes I think I'm not even close. In terms of becoming like Jesus, I have plenty of room to grow. How about you? Thank you for joining me again this week as we look and reflect on the readings for Sunday, um, the sixth Sunday of Easter, also Mother's Day. I hope you're having a great week. Take care. God bless.